Welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Anisha Bandari, and I am the Security Policy Program Manager here at Google. In addition to my main role, I also run the Movies Club here, and I'd like to welcome Director Jeff Orolowski to discuss The Social Dilemma, a blend of documentary investigation and narrative drama on the human impact of social networking. Jeff Orolowski is the director, producer, and cinematographer of the award-winning film Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice. Jason Kroll received the U.S. Documentary Audience Award at Sundance in 2017. Chasing Ice received the Documentary Cinematography Award at Sundance in 2012 and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. Both films were shortlisted for an Academy Award for Best Documentary, screened at Congress and the United Nations, and have garnered awards and accolades from film festivals around the world. Jeff founded Exposure Labs, a production company dedicated to impact through film. His latest film, The Social Dilemma, had its world premiere at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and is now featured on Netflix. We welcome Jeff Orolowski to Talks at Google to discuss his latest film. Hello, Jeff, and thank you for joining. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anisha. It's wonderful to have you. I hope yeah. you're doing well. Doing, the doing great today. Yep. Yeah. Nice weather, springtime, vaccinated, feeling good. <laughs> feeling good. It's great to have the vaccine, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah. Um, so I just want to have like a, just a quick conversation about um, the making of the film and understanding um, of your background as well. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple questions I'll run through. So the first is, why did you decide on this film? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, just again, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, we got into this film. Um, uh, it was in large part through... Um, through my college and friends and peers that I went to school with at Stanford. Um, you know, at Stanford, we had lots of people that ended up working at Facebook, Twitter, Google, um, up and down Silicon Valley. And um, it was hearing from Tristan Harris um, years ago uh, in 2017, I started to hear the glimmers from him around persuasive design and design techniques that were used for different intentions. And um, I had so many friends who worked in the industry and I've, I always had just the, the absolute most optimist positive frame of technology. Um, and I love technology. I still love technology. Um, but the the question was being posed by Tristan around, is the technology fully serving the public? And, and that was really like the, the initial question and curiosity where, what are the unintended consequences of the design? Are you measuring the right thing? Um, is, you know, are, are we counting and measuring the things that matter most to users and to the public? Um, are there downstream effects of the business models? And so those are, those are questions that were very, very new to me um, and very fresh to me and things that we, we wanted to explore. Yeah. And how did you describe, decide on the script and how did it all come together? Yeah, we started, a lot of it started with interviews. Um, so first with Tristan and uh, members of his team at the Center for Humane Technology, um, and then meeting other people in the space, um, friends who worked at different companies um, in different levels, executives and, and the whole spectrum. Um, and for our process as a, you know, as a nonfiction film, it was really leaning into what are we learning from the experts? What are we learning from engineers? I knew nothing about algorithms really going into it. Um, it was a confusing concept. It was a lot of explaining from a lot of people around what algorithms can or cannot do or how they are effective or not. Um, and then I think part of your question around the script and the narrative portion of the film, um, you know, I think for us, we didn't really want the film to be straight talking heads, um, which was sort of the low hanging fruit creatively. Um, we, it could have been very easy to make a film of just you know subject matter experts talking about different aspects of what they know and understand, but we wanted to make it more accessible and more relatable. Um, and part of that was, uh, you know, we were wanting to anthropomorphize and bring to life um, algorithms. And so a whole storyline kind of developed out of that in those conversations. That's really interesting, good to know. So what were you trying to elicit by portraying users as puppets? Um, a discussion as to how we get everyone together or to make better choices for themselves? Yeah, um, I think the puppet language and frame there, um, I guess there is a visual that kind of explicitly portrays that. Um, but I think for me personally, you know, in my use of social media, um, the question that I kept thinking about that was that was posed to us is we go in thinking that we have free choice and agency on the content that we're seeing, and yet we're not choosing the menu from which we're choosing. Who is choosing and how are we being shown different things that we are choosing from? 
And I think, you know, I went into my, you know, my social media experience and days when I was on it really thinking, oh, I'm getting a glimpse of the entire world. I'm seeing all the same stuff that my friends are seeing. Oh, we talk about what's going viral and what's trending. But what I didn't realize was the filtering that happens, the limited perspectives that could potentially come as a result of those algorithms and, and what we were understanding or not in our engagement with the algorithms. Um, so that was the, a big breakthrough for me. Um, and recognizing, you know, as we as we've seen political polarization, as we've seen um, misinformation going viral on different platforms, wanting to just shine a light and pose the question of there are other elements at play here um, that that the public isn't really aware of in terms of what information is being shown to them and why. Yeah, I'd, I would agree. So how did you come up with the visual representation of the algorithm, the machines, and what was the inspiration? Um, we spent a lot of time, as I was saying, we spent a lot of time talking with uh, different engineers and explaining how algorithms work and people at, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or different, you know, um, news feeds that were uh, being commonly used. And I was trying to wrap my head around and understand, like, what are the different factors? What are the different things driving what is going to show me a particular piece of content at a particular time? Um, what we really wanted to do was to bring to life what we learned as being some of the three, like the three main levers around growth, engagement, and advertising. Um, and so we were trying to portray those as three different algorithms that are operating to fill a particular, you know, social media feed. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of nuance and complexity to all of that. And then there are algorithms within them and subsets. And um, but what we were really trying to do is just to bring to life the different notion of different intentions um, for different algorithms. Uh, that's that's where it was absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and this is where I think of, uh, the question that does circle back around business models, the question around, well, if we design an algorithm for a business model, what are those consequences that could come as a result? Um, and so these are obviously, these are very, very challenging and complicated questions, um, things that I know countless people are, are thinking about and working on, um, but that's what we were trying to, to showcase. So when I was watching it, I got vibes of The Matrix. Did you use The Matrix as inspiration? <laughs> The Matrix was definitely a really fascinating reference that we kept coming back to. Um, and there are times where I have felt absolutely that we are already living in the Matrix and we don't even realize it. You know, the, the, the digitization of our real world lives and now the connection between that digital version of ourselves to predictions of ourselves being in large parts, the backbone of, of social media and social networking as it exists today, there's a really interesting like cause and effect dynamic that's happening there. Um, and, and I think countless times, I think January 6th was also a very prime example just of a, a recognition at the society level that, wait a second, we are operating on different stories. We are living in our own individual Truman shows, um, our individual versions of reality. Um, so, uh, but the matrix, uh, the matrix came up many times in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so how was working with Netflix, a company that relies on algorithms to capture user attention on yeah. a documentary condemning that practice? Um, so we made the film independently, um, uh, completely funded independently. We made it independently and we premiered it at Sundance a year ago in January of 2020. And that's where Netflix saw the film and picked it up. Um, and so this was not made at Netflix and it wasn't produced by Netflix. Um, but they, because of the way acquisitions work, it is, uh, it has the Netflix original stamp on it. Um, and so, uh, obviously there are, um, there are lots of conversations we can have around algorithms specifically with Netflix. Um, I think the big distinction for me uh, is that with the subscri subscription model that Netflix does employ, um, the alignment feels very clear. Um, the users are subscribing and they're wanting, they're looking for content. Um, it, and, and it's also a place where we don't see misinformation and conspiracy theory running viral and rampant. Um, and so I've been spending time thinking through, you know, to what degree are these user generated content problems versus algorithmic? It's, it's a, some blend of user generated content and business model and machine learning algorithms and personalization, some like blend of these things where any one of those seems fine and defensible. But when you start adding a bunch of them up, we get into this like murkiness of, 
of misinformation, conspiracy theory, you know, misinformation on COVID, um, political polarization, like why and where and how are those things coming up and why? Um, and so those are just, you know, the big questions I think we all have to wrestle with. Mm -hmm. And so moving on, how did you find and recruit the speakers throughout the film? Hmm. Um, a lot of that was, um, whether through uh, friends that I knew from Stanford as a starting point, um, and that's honestly how I was exposed to the idea and the subject matter in the first place, reaching out through their networks, doing independent research, trying to find different speakers on the issue. Um, you know, we started working on this in 2017 into 2018, and um, I hadn't seen many people from the tech industry talking about some of the challenges uh, about the tech industry. Um, and it was kind of a very nascent stage. Um, of course, there were academics who had been thinking about this and writing about it for a long time, um, but that was a, a relatively new world for us. Um, so we have a whole team of people that were doing active research and trying to find um, you know, people who were speaking in, in thoughtful and insightful ways around the issue. That's great. And is there anybody that you've that was not featured in the film that you would have liked to see? We have countless interviews that we did with people that they just didn't fit into the film for time reasons. Um, uh, but there's there are people that I didn't know about at the time and would have wished I could have done interviews with. So I think at the top of that list is Sophia Noble, um, who wrote a book called Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and for us to understand where racism and oppression and bias lives in algorithms in different ways is like super important for everybody to understand and think about. So I, that's my, my biggest, I wish I could have done a scene with Sophia. Yeah. Um, and so there was a visible lack of diversity throughout the film. And why do you think that was? You know, we started really looking at who were the um, people, the the insiders from the tech industry who were willing and able to speak out. Um, I think that is a self like self selecting group in some ways, right? So the the people within the industry who were comfortable and confident enough to go on the record, who felt not at risk, who weren't vulnerable. Um, those were where we got introduced into the work and that's where the earliest people came came onto the project those were predominantly white men um absolutely um it's later in the film where we were able to research and get uh, other subject matter experts um to chime in and to have a greater and wider conversation uh, both in terms of female representation and other people of color um and so that comes in not through the insiders that we met um but through the the kind of external outside the tech industry critics. Um, and the way the film had been structured, we were starting inside the industry and then went to outside critique. Um, and so that's how it kind of represented at the end. Okay, that's interesting. And so what was the biggest difference for you in making a movie about climate versus tech and societal issues? Um, our past films on climate, as you mentioned, um, I honestly looked at all of this as just a straight continuation. Um, uh, talking about big existential challenges that tie in with business models and, and financial interests that, um, you know, I, I feel so much empathy for the tech industry in a similar way that I look at the fossil fuel industry, where a hundred years ago, if you discovered oil in the ground and figured out ways to like provide this great resource for the planet. Hey, look, we can run engines, we can fly, we can travel faster and farther. Like that just seemed like the most amazing opportunity from fossil fuels a hundred something years ago. And it's only decades into that process that you recognize, wait a second, there are consequences to this business model and to this practice that are affecting society, affecting health, affecting humanity. And what do we do about that? And I think that's the phase that we're in right now with a lot of these, um, tech platforms and social media and search. It's like this this provided such positive, great opportunity for society for so long. And yet we're now getting into this inertia with the system and the real unintended consequences of the system where we have to you know, pause for a second and say, well, wait a second, what, what is happening as a result of these things that we've built? And what are the consequences? And to both do the research, understand and recognize the consequences, to take ownership and accountability on those consequences, and then to fix them for the betterment of society. And so for me, the, those are complete parallels from climate and, and tech. Um, I think these are the biggest issues in terms of, you know, it, it's it's to some degree, it's asymmetric power. To some degree, it's exponential change. To some degree, it's it's, you know, how are we changing and shaping humanity on planet Earth? 
in a short period of time. Um, and so the, the way that our information ecosystem operates, just the way that the same way that our natural ecosystem operates, these are two sides of a coin around, um, you know, what is the future of humanity going to look like? Yeah, and technology has enabled many industries, not just media, to become more Absolutely. sophisticated and targeted, such as food, yeah. medicine, and fitness. Yeah. So I have, Go ahead. Uh, just on that point, like I, like I said, I love technology. Technology is great. We use cam I got into all of this because I loved computers growing up and I loved cameras. I think the question, this is not an anti-technology conversation for me. This is not a Luddite conversation. This is a question around the alignment of the incentives at scale between the technology that we create and the general public. A lot of these technology platforms weren't designed for civic discourse, civil conversation around how do we best inform uh, and have rational, deep, nuanced conversation. You know, Twitter is a decontextualizing platform. Like you can't have nuanced conversation on Twitter, right? It's just like a, it's not designed around that. Um, and so when we operate with different technologies that have now reached billions and billions of people, um, and it changes the way we see and understand the world, those are some of the, the challenges that, that we just have to, to wrestle with. Well, with advertisers and adoption and engagement driven business models are arguably as old as the media industry itself. Do we as a society need to recognize some side some kind of continuity rather than thinking that this is a totally new phenomenon that we need to prevent? Um, yes and no. I think it is a totally new phenomenon. I think there's a, I mean, the continuity from a gun to a nuclear weapon is they're not the same trajectory. Um, I think part of the notion, and as we were saying earlier too, like if you isolate advertising and just look at advertising or isolate machine learning algorithms or isolate user generated content or isolate, um, you know, personalization, any one of these things seems totally innocent and innocuous on its own. But when you start combining them together and have advertising incentives with user generated content, with personalization, with ML algorithms, we start to get into these these interesting consequences when you when you look at them across the system. So, um, for me, it's not so much uh, you know we can talk about advertising and the advertising model and advertising incentive, but there's a big difference around a billboard, like a shared billboard. We all see the same billboard. If there's a problem with the billboard, we're going to call it out and we're going to have a conversation about it. If I'm on an individual feed, the incentive and imperative for the advertising to place ads in front of my eyeballs and the content that the ML algorithm is going to then devise to reverse engineer what's going to, you know, what do I want to see? That's not a shared conversation anymore. These platforms are, in my mind, they're not public squares. These are private squares. I get my own set of personal billboards and personal content that's going to keep me looking at the at those ads and that's completely different than a shared conversation on a newspaper or even a shared ad on a on a television program um, so i think these are very very different um creations and di very different iterations and i think the personalization has a lot to do with it oh yeah i would agree i mean personalization is something that can be good and also be perceived as bad, but in many ways, it's a good thing because you don't have to share, stare at a shared billboard that you don't care about. Right, but these are, these are I'm completely with you, these are challenges around, oh, but I don't want to look at that thing. And, um, you know, one of, one of our subjects, Kathy O'Neill um, referenced this example when she was working um, at this company and they were doing ad related work. And one of the investors made a comment about I can't wait until I don't see those ads that I see all the time about the local community college and et cetera, et cetera. And that was a light bulb moment for Kathy to recognize that, wait a second, we are just discriminating on the internet now. Like the notion of personalization has all of these implications around what people see or don't see, what they have access to or what they don't have access to, how they're targeted or not. And, and this is a super nuanced conversation. Um, I, I just want to share one analogy that's been in my mind quite a bit lately, and I, I bring it to the Galapagos Island. And we're, we're all familiar with Galapagos and a place of evolution, and Darwin is able to see different trends in different islands. But if I'm now in a personalized ML feed, I'm on my own individual algorithm, 
and you're on your own island, you're on some, everybody's on their own individual islands. And the fast, the more you engage with the algorithms, the faster evolution happens. And what I'm concerned about is as we're all on our own individual islands and we're all evolving faster and faster, as we know from nature, that's how you get speciation. Like the islands effectively drift farther and farther apart from each other. We no longer have the same, the ability to connect in, in nature that one species turns into two species. And in continuing this analogy here, what I'm, what I'm concerned about is my ideas might no longer be compatible with your ideas, that our ideas, the actual, you know, our DNA packages of information that we're engaging with that, that's evolving from the algorithms are now potentially spreading and distancing themselves such that somebody on the far left and somebody on the far right, it's, it's impossible, it's practically impossible for them to come together and engage in a deep conversation. They're operating off of such different backgrounds. They're operating off of different information and facts and, and stories and understandings of the world. And I, I think it's it's more it's more deeply entrenching us in differing perspectives. And I just I bring that example up because you know we're a decade plus into this experiment of how ML algorithms are affecting information distribution on the planet. And what does that look like with another decade of evolution and another decade of evolution beyond that? And if we continue the status quo, is it is it just going to build an even more political polarization like by design in the system is that the unintended consequence and is the output is that the output and so the question in my mind is like how do we design the technology to bring us together how do we design the technology to engage in challenging nuanced conversations where if somebody disagrees with somebody else it's not like F you block I'm not going to follow you and and we're like that's the end of the conversation where is the place or the space that allows people to to build those bridges? Well, how would you change the narrative now that we have been living 14 months into a pandemic? Uh, can you clarify your question? Change the narrative? How so? Of technology is actually in many ways has brought people together in the last 14 months during the pandemic because it's I, the only media that we can connect. Um, absolutely. Once again, it's not an anti-technology conversation in my mind. Um, I have not used social media for years and because of the making of this film, but I wasn't disconnected from friends or family during COVID. I was using FaceTime regularly, using Zoom, using platforms like this, like StreamYard, platforms that many people we pay for, right? To be able to get those services and those features. So the ability for technology to connect is totally different than the consequences that come from in some cases, free products, in some cases, ad supported products. Like So uh, there's, there's a lot of nuance there around uh, the pros and cons. Um, but I would add, <laughs> I do feel like a lot of my friends who have been heavily on social media for the last year, I, I worry about doom scrolling. I worry about like the anxiety and the stress and the pressure that as a society we're feeling in large part, I think because of you know what we're engaging with and what we're what we're con what we're filling our lives with from an information perspective, I can't tell you like in the making of the film, I stopped my social media addiction, um, and I I weaned myself off and I got off of the the for me it was Facebook that was the most addictive platform, um, and I stopped um, engaging there. And first of all, it did open up a lot of creative time and energy for me, but at the same time, it made me more and more aware of what I was filter bubbling myself around. Like I was seeing when I looked back and I looked, I, I went one day and looked back at my, you know, history of posts and what was I seeing and why was I sharing certain things and what were the reinforcement loops that were happening for me personally and how did it shift me from who I was prior to that to who I feel like I actually am. And that it was fascinating to sort of look back at the 30,000 foot perspective to explore what was most engaging to me and what I was sharing. Um, I don't feel like my life is worse not being on social media. Um, and, and so the, the question around engaging with community, um, using FaceTime or Zoom, having group calls, still being connected with friends and family in a deep way. I feel like I'm I'm closer with my fr close friends and family than I've ever been. And, and that's not, you know, that's not because of the technology necessarily, that's like using the technology wisely, I guess. All right. Now I would say, I don't, I wouldn't consider FaceTime or Zoom to be social media platforms. Those are yeah. meeting. Platform. Right. 
Fair but enough. that's where, but that's technology that's designed yeah. for connection. And that's where I want to lean into what you're, how you're defining that because technology in that case is really powerful and beautiful and enhances human capacity. That was, I mean, we make this homage to Steve Jobs in the film um, and this, this reference that he used around how can the, how can a computer be a bicycle for the mind? And if I could just break that down for a second, because a bicycle is a tool that's sitting there waiting to be used. And when you want to use it, you can travel farther and you can travel faster. And that tool enhances the human abilities. And that's what I, what I, when I think about technology right now, we are in different parts of the country having this conversation. This is a great like use of technology to facilitate conversation. When is it being designed for the enhancement of the human capacity versus in some cases, when is it being designed around like, well, how can we optimize for revenue? How can we optimize for, you know, how much money can we make this quarter? Can we build tools to grow? Is growing, is time on site actually a valuable metric? Like we've convinced ourselves that time equals quality. And I think what we've seen is that time as a unit of measure is not the best rubric for quality of life or learning or growth or any of these things. And, and, and we're falling victim to, you know, uh, metrics and, and proxies that are not representative of what necessarily is, is best for the public. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, so what's your perspective on influencers? And many people have built their careers on social media. And many of those are people that would not have done so had it not been social media as a platform. Um, that's a great question. It's an interesting question. You're well, I guess, first of all, um, there are different platforms that one could engage with and engage in conversation that have different goals and objectives. So I'm a huge fan of Patreon. Um, Clubhouse is really interesting as a new platform coming out. Um, these are platforms that are designed for the, the user, the, the content creator, the person who's wanting to share to build a different model that's not about optimizing for numbers and eyeballs and clicks, where, hey, look, this is my work. Do you like it? And do you, can you support me to keep making my work? Or, hey, here's a community and we wanna have a conversation. And at least my understanding as of now is that Clubhouse does not intend to go down the advertising route. Um, so there are desires and needs to have conversation and engagement in society, but, but I, I question the use of some platforms. I mean, this is where I've, you know, in my own personal, you know, intention to stop using these platforms, I just didn't want to be part of that machine. And so that's how I represented it personally. Um, but if, if somebody is trying, you know, I'm a huge fan of activists trying to use different platforms in different ways, but I just going back to that Galapagos analogy, I still reflect on the fact that like, if you're not seeing that content, if you're not in that bubble, you're, you're in a completely different isolated world. And I don't know necessarily if these platforms are, are solving the problems. Moving on towards a little bit, the way forward. So we've had, we've discussed a lot about how social media is what it is today and that it has some of the negative consequences from the reinforcement that, and the addiction and all of the mental health problems that have come with overuse of social media. But what do you think is the societal fix for the problems you see in this film or that you pose? Oh, um, societal fix. It's a great question. Um, I think the first step is education and awareness, which is why we made the film in the first place. Um, I do think that legislation is potentially coming down the line. And I think there are big questions around what does that legislation look like? I don't have answers for that. I think a lot of people are posing those questions and not really sure. Um, uh, I also think that there are huge opportunities for new technology platforms, things like Clubhouse, where people can come and engage and they're gonna just find that they find greater value out of it. Um, you know, if you're in a deep nuanced conversation on Clubhouse for an hour and you're learning something and you're being exposed to new ideas and new perspectives, you tend to leave that conversation feeling like, wow, I, I learned something and I, I feel good after using this and oh, look at this community and, and people that I've, I've connected with. Um, that tends to be a very different experience than other social media platforms. And I think my curiosity and hope is that more and more platforms like that are going to be born where people just genuinely want, like imagine social media designed to make you feel closer to your close friends and family. 
and designed to make you feel more informed about the world and understand more nuanced perspectives. Like that's a completely different ground up mandate for a lot of different companies. And so if that opportunity existed, right, I, I think people are going to naturally gravitate towards those, those other types of platforms. Where do you see such a vision coming from? I think the youth see it and know it. I think, I mean, in the conversations that we've had, um, you know, to, a lot of these platforms were designed in college dorm rooms, right? And we're seeing high school students and college students who are eager and hungry to design new technology. I mean, just from our, our events and our outreach, we have met countless high school students and college students who feel the pressures coming from social media in their day-to-day -day lives. And they know the downside, you know, I'm, I'm a millennial. Um, I'm 37 years old. I remember what the world was like before social media. I remember a high school experience where like getting my first cell phone was a really, really big deal, but I could just send very expensive text messages. Right. And, and that was, that was an experience that, that was in the pre social media era. And Gen Zers and kids today are growing up. This is the experience of understanding and knowing the world. It is entrenched in the world of social media, entrenched in a world where we, we constantly heard this, the notion that kids have to always be on. As a junior high school student, as a 12 year old, you have this pressure to always be on. And, and these are pressures that like, I didn't have to deal with growing up. Um, and, and, and those are pressures where I think kids are recognizing this is not what they want. You know, this is not how they want to live their lives and, and looking and curious for a different way. Um, and so that, that's something that we've been hearing quite a bit. And, and I have hope that, you know, some of those, some of those students will want to design and build their own platforms and their own technology and, and, and build something as, as part of that response. Yeah, and there's a lot of positive data out there that Gen Z, which is the next generation, is um, tends to be a little bit more benevolent than the previous generations. They have far less cyberbullying. Um, they tend to care more for society and humanity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree. I would like to yeah. see them be the solution. So fingers crossed. So in the next couple of foreseeable future, since we're still in a pandemic, um, what it, would you think would be an immediate fix? Um, if, uh, this was a line from one of our subjects that didn't make it into the film, um, Jaron Lanier, he had this, uh, quote that he, that he shared with us, um, that if you're privileged enough to not be on social media, he said, you have a positive responsibility to get off of social media and that your engagement and your use of it is actually perpetuating and hurting others that are in the system. And it's a line that, that I thought about a lot and our team talked about quite a bit. And um, I think that's where I, I took my own person, uh, personal responsibility around wanting to get myself off of the platforms. So I think there is a question for those of those of uh, you who can or are able to or are willing to, um, there is a, a responsibility factor in my mind around removing yourself from some of those platforms. Um, I think uh, that's just one aspect of a very large conversation. You know, I think this is something where when we when we jumped into the making of this film it became very clear very quickly just how broad and expansive this issue is so within tech we're talking about mental health we're talking about information ecosystem uh, information ecosystems we're talking about bias and algorithms we're talking about a, a bunch of different companies and uh, I, I think where I've gravitated towards in terms of my own, I think those are the, the zones that I care about the most, but teen mental health being a huge part of the equation, but then also the information ecosystem and what and how, like how are people getting and consuming the information that we get? Um, and so for me personally, I have subscribed to and I pay for a bunch of different news outlets and I try to get my news from news organizations directly and I try to look at what the human curation and the editorial um, insights are. I look for a diversity of political perspectives that I'm subscribing to and, and checking in with just to get a, a comprehensive scope and I try to get my information that way and not being fed by by an algorithm. Um, so I know that I have a bit more intention and a, and sense of a wider political conversation. And it's it's more work and more responsibility and more outlets to check and and constantly checking different news outlets. Um, 
but uh, but I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that it's giving me a, a more um, balanced perspective of the world than coming from a feed or an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So in five years, where do you see social media and society? Oh, um, there's an optimistic path and there's a pessimistic path. <laughs> um, the, the pessimistic side, uh, just to reference what one of our subjects, Tim Kendall, who was a former um, head of monetization at Facebook and uh, former president of Pinterest, um, when, when we asked him what he was most concerned about in the film, his response was civil war. And I think January 6th points to the political polarization that we're experiencing in the country. And um, that is my worst case scenario on the pessimistic side of me is that we become so deeply politically polarized that we cannot engage and it, it dismantles our democracy and dismantles politics. Um, and I hope we don't go down that path. Um, that is a fear and a concern. And I do honestly believe that that is being driven in large part um, through, these, through these platforms. The optimistic side of me is that we have a shift and a change and a reckoning um, that we uh, can design tools and technologies that can build bridges, that can bring us back together, that can um, help us address and answer the biggest challenges that we face, like climate change. Um, and, and how do we come together as a society to bring out the best in each other and to support each other to make strides and to make progress on these issues? Um, that and I think I think really powerful new technology can help support that and can allow for that. Um, I've always pictured like what is what's a social media platform that's going to connect me with somebody that I agree with on eighty percent of things, but there's some twenty percent of things that we totally disagree about, and I never would have known. And that person's going to be a really great friend, but we're still going to be able to have like really deep, challenging, tough conversations. Right. That's I feel like in different pockets of my life, I've had those people where I could go into those deep nuance. Well, wait a second. We have like we have a difference in values or difference in perspective or background or understanding. And like, let's get into those conversations. And I feel like it's harder and harder, harder and harder these days to find those places and those conversations. And so. Can we design technology that that enables that, that supports that? Maybe that's not going to be something that everybody wants to jump into, but the the places and the, you know, if that could be designed well, I think there's a desire and a thirst and a hunger for it. Yeah, I would agree. And how do you see the public or companies that you spoke about would have reacted to this film? In your perfect world, what would have been the outcome? Um, in the most perfect world, uh, I think we would have had a, a mass acknowledgement that we need to move off of this business model. I think that is my most perfect ideal world scenario. Um, you know, one of, our, one of our subjects, Shoshana Zuboff, she wrote this book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And her framework and her, um, her push and desire is that we need to actually outlaw surveillance capitalism. Um, and that seems like a really, really big uh, shift in terms of how certain technology platforms exist today. Um, but we are seeing movements in different organizations pushing to ban surveillance, um, surveillance advertising, as an example. Um, and I think there is more and more conversation around like, how do we move off of these systems? You know, whether it is a Facebook, a Twitter, a Google, a TikTok, or any of these platforms, like, how do we really align the incentives with the users? And and I think this is where we have to really challenge ourselves and ask these questions around like, what is in the best interest of the public? Where I think it starts with understanding the downstream consequences and, and impacts, which we're seeing more and more. I think it's a matter of tech companies opening up their, um, their data for third party researchers to explore and go deep on and to really understand what are these consequences? You know, what is YouTube's algorithm doing to society or not? Where is rabbit holing happening or not? Um, a lot of things are pretty innocuous. You know, if I'm into like playing the ukulele, which I am, and I want to watch a video that's going to help teach me some techniques, like that's not changing my political persuasion or really affecting the way I see the world. 
And there's so much very innocent content on the internet that people are engaging with. Um, but you have these categories that have huge consequences. Um, and, and I think um, the, the harm that we've seen, both uh, from a discrimination perspective, um, hate speech perspective, these are things that we, we need more research and more studying around like to, to really unpackage where is this happening and why and how do we, we fix it and resolve it. Um, and to what degree is the business imperative pushing or nudging or cajoling different companies down different paths that have these consequences. And it's so easy to turn a blind eye because they're so profitable. So I, I think my my most ideal dream scenario is to, to get a sense that these conversations are happening internally and that companies are saying, well, wait a second, like what would our timeline be to get off of this business model? How do we really empower um, the public and the users? We recognizing the power that companies have in shaping the information landscape of billions of people. Um, and when recommendations can be a bad thing and the harms that can come from recommendations. Um, I, I think those are, that would be my, my biggest curiosity. Yeah, uh, totally agree with that. Um, so now we're moving on to the question and answer portion. Um, the audience has been anxiously viewing, but we have about 300 people in the audience at the moment um, cool. watching. So let me just get over to questions and yeah. All right, the first one by Gerhard Gaimari. What is your call to action for those using ad-driven platforms to make their careers example influencers and similarly those developing these platforms? Um, I, I feel like we hit this a little bit earlier in terms of uh, when we were talking about influencers. Um, I'm a big fan of the non ad driven platforms and would recommend people use those and try to shift towards them. And I would recommend <laughs> that the ad driven platforms figure out ways to migrate away from being ad driven platforms. Um, you know, I, I don't want to oversimplify because the advertising, as we said, like advertising is one slice of this like complicated conversation. And uh, I think there's going to need to be more and more research around like why and where are we seeing the worst consequences coming out of the technology platforms. Um, and uh, but I, I think the the business incentive is a really important um, place to look and examine um, what those consequences uh, what those consequences are and, and how do we shift them? Yeah, I agree. Next, next question from Michael. Thanks for speaking in this film. It motivated me to delete Instagram and Facebook. Are recommendation engines and algorithms inherently amoral, or is the delineating line? they cross that proves destructive or harmful? Um, great question. Um, it's not that they're amoral, it's that they're unmoral. Um, and there's a nuance in the definition there that I think is relevant for the conversation because morality doesn't apply to uh, an ML algorithm. It's not thinking about the morals or the value or the the nuance, the the, the implications of the content that is being shown. And we did try to lean into this a little bit with, with the social dilemma and the representation of the algorithms determining or deciding what to show, because it's, it's not like the algorithm is looking at a piece of content and saying, wow, this is harmful and bad for society and messed up and has antiquated values or anything. It's not making that assessment and then showing it to somebody. It's saying, oh, this is doing really well and people really, really like it regardless of its content and regardless of the values and let me show it to somebody. And I think that's where um, the removal of human curation, I've oddly, I've become very enamored with human curation more and more lately. Um, I think in part it has to do with uh, my, my uh, role as an artist and going to film festivals and seeing when a great cura curatorial team can put together a slate of movies and say, look, these are the things that we want you to watch this year. These are the best films that we've been able to find. And it's going to represent diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, different types of filmmakers. I, I now cherish what quality human curation can do and can can offer. Of course, there are consequences and who are the gatekeepers and who's who is sitting in those positions of power and privilege. Um, but the 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 opportunity for quality human curation is really really valuable in my mind, um, and you don't really get that from an ML algorithm. It's not you know it's not introducing things in the same way that a person would, um, and I think this is where um, 
I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately. There's this, you know, pyramid, there's data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And in this pyramid, this data in this, in this, uh, trends, like the, the transfer from data to wisdom, the internet excels, like the internet is all data and sh it shares information. And pretty much all the things that you can get on the internet, you're like you're looking for and you're finding information. You can't easily find wisdom on the internet. Wisdom is context. Wisdom is application. Wisdom is like after you have a bunch of information and you then can interpret it to get your knowledge, then interpret that to have wisdom. Like that is applying to where I am in my life and what thing I need, which you get from a mentor, you get from uh, an advisor, you get from a teacher that understands where somebody is and can apply knowledge specifically to that case. And I, I think one of the things that we've sort of been lost in in this internet era in some ways is we are so inundated with information. We're overwhelmed by information that that's all we see and know. And that's what we, that's like, if it doesn't exist on Google, it doesn't exist, right? If I search for something and if I can't find a result, there must be no answer. Like that, that's the instinct that I have now. Like where, oh, I hit a dead end if I couldn't find it. As opposed to where I think the mindset used to be is, oh, I have to find an expert. I have to find the person who knows that piece of information. Maybe it's an engineer, maybe it's a historian, maybe it's somebody else who, who can take my question and give me the information and the knowledge and the context to provide wisdom on it. And that's something where I, I, I've, um, you know, as a doc filmmaker, I feel the privilege of, hey, I can call somebody and get nuance and like, can we sit, can we do an interview? Can you give me the context around ideas? But this is one of the things that I'm, I'm worried about, especially as a generation of youth, just we've lost wisdom we've lost kind of that you know that knowledge that we seek from elders in some way because we think oh we can just get it quickly on the internet and you know my phone is the pathway to all everything that i need and if it's not there it doesn't exist I, there's something there that i think um we're reckoning with as, as a society yep uh next question from emma do you think people who have never used social media are better off than those who of us who got sucked in is it too late to go to cold turkey um, great question. It is not too late to go to go to cold turkey. Um, and I think of my friends from college who never got on social media. And I kind of imagine what that experience was like and what that world was like. And I, I cherish and revere those those experiences um, and, and those those individuals. I also have friends of mine who um, who were older that when social media was happening, I remember I had all these conversations with them around like, oh, you're going to love it. It's amazing. Look at this. And they just, they didn't get it. And I think that notion of them not getting it was actually tying into a deeper truth of like, what are we, what are we doing here? Like why, like we're all now just trying to sell our own story. Like we're all just trying, like in some ways I look at it as a capitalist representation of capitalist intent around individuals and corporate, like these platforms now in many ways are just ways and places to sell things, um, whether it's a company trying to sell things or an individual trying to sell themselves. And it's not about human connection at all. And like, if I zoom really, really far back and see like, see social media as a representation of capitalist intent, then I'm really torn on, you know, what, what is this entire system of, you know, colonization and capitalism doing to humanity and these being the places where they're being represented in really, really effective, powerful, asymmetrically powerful ways right now. So the um, if you have a desire to get off of social media, I think you absolutely can. Um, you can also go to our website, thesocialdilemma.com, and you can see we have tools there and resources around rebooting your own relationship with social media um, and discussion guides and ways to engage, but um, all being a way to help reflect on what, what are you getting out of your time on these platforms? Um, and is it is it actually benefiting you or not? And to pose those questions to yourself. Um, just one, one last thought that one of our subjects shared um, that really made me think, um, and he, he posed this question. Um, so when you're, you're about to make that post on social media, just pause for a second and ask yourself, why are you posting that thing that you're posting? And I started to realize, um, Hey, I'm a filmmaker. I went to this red carpet event and I took a photo. Hey, look at the selfie with me and this famous person that I didn't engage with. 
I turned this human to human dynamic into a completely transactional extractive, hey, can I take a, can I steal a photograph with you? And I posted it for that social validation and affirmation because I knew hundreds of people are going to like this thing. Like, I just know me and this celebrity, people are going to love it. And oh, me and this life update, people are going to love this. People are going to like you post things because you, you know, before you post it, you know what posts are going to do well and what posts are going to do poorly. And, and we're hearing this from Gen Z all the time. Like if the post doesn't get enough response positively quick enough, then they delete it or they modify it or like change the filters. And how do we create this false representation of ourselves or this like really spun representation of ourselves just so we get that positive affirmation that we know is coming if I press these buttons in this order. And, and that, that personal reflection made me feel a little bit more gross about like what I was using it for and why. And it made me recognize like, what are the consequences happening to other people? You know, when I look at somebody else's posts and I feel envious or I feel jealous or I feel all those things, I am passing that on to somebody else too, who is then going to see my post and my affirmation. And look, I hung with this celebrity and I had hundreds of likes on this thing. And, and I'm just putting that, that emotional burden on somebody else in that process. So, um, for me, it was, it was, uh, aside from having to like wean myself off of it, um, uh, going cold turkey was fine. Wow. So next question from Sandeep. What is your analysis on how Wikipedia has remained the most accurate in the tsunami of misinformation? Can that model be scaled to all of social media? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. And I think Wikipedia is just a great example of a platform that's not ad driven. It was built on a different value set. Whether you're talking about Craigslist or Wikipedia, there like there's so many platforms that exist like that where it is about community. It's and it's not driven through an extractive model. So I've become a big fan of um, both nonprofit um, technology platforms, nonprofit business models, um, and then there's a growing. Um, uh, world of nonprofit capitalism that I'm hearing more and more about. And how do we shift the systems? You know, the, the, the notion of let's Shoshana Zuboff uses this, this analogy in her book, the age of surveillance capitalism. And I think the analogy in, when compared to planet earth is really, really valuable because what we know so clearly around the natural world, the physical world and, and the fossil fuel industry, like we have, we have turned our physical planet into a bunch of raw resources for extraction. Capitalism has figured out how to turn everything on planet earth into money and anything that we can pull out of the ground, anything that we can sell, anything we can chop down or kill or take can be turned into somebody's profit. And the parallel that she extends to surveillance capitalism is now that we have digitized our lives, we have turned humanity and our digital experiences into raw resources for extraction. And, and that's an example where Wikipedia would not fit the description of surveillance capitalism. It is not trying to extract from an editor or poster like to get them to post more or to do different things. It's designed around the goal of providing information on each of these articles and, and posts, and the community has incentive and value to create and curate that. Um, it's very different than, than a capitalist intent uh, coming out of uh, you know, some platform. So, so I think that's a, um, that would be my, my quick answer on, on the question. Great, next question. From So Ray, if companies wanted to do better, what would be the metrics we could use to measure improvements? Metrics would enable us to test different solutions and see what works and what doesn't. Yes, it's a great question. And the tricky thing is that it's not the easiest answer, but I do think that these are these are questions that we need to explore. Let me, let me start with journalism as an example and then maybe carry it over to tech because Journalism also does unfortunately fall under some of the same eyeballs and metrics rubrics around, you know, what posts are doing well and what, you know, how much are is different content being viewed. Um, journalism could be framed around, hey, of our subscribers, we can do subjective surveys. We can do analytical surveys around, do you feel like our information is fair and balanced? 
Do you feel like you're getting a comprehensive view and perspective of the world? Do you feel like you trust our publication? And how do you optimize for trust? How do you optimize for nuance? How do you optimize not for the hit count, but for did does our coverage change the way you see the world? Does it fill you? Like there are so many other ways we could measure and explore what good journalism would look like. And, you know, I, if you read a, a long, thoughtful, comprehensive piece um, that gives you a completely new insight, um, it might not get the most number of views or the most number of clicks, but it might be the thing that changes the rest of your life. And we have to ask better questions. We have to be measuring better things. So what does that mean for, for social media and search, right? Um, I think these are questions. And, and one of the tricky things is that the public doesn't have full insight into how the platforms work. They don't know what they're seeing versus what they're not seeing. Um, so inherently they're coming in with a filtered experience, but is social media making you feel more connected with your friends and family? Uh, to what degree? You know, uh, I want to go to one example, just going, going back to numbers, because um, Facebook has their um, friends you may know algorithm, and that was a really effective tool early on to grow the size of the network. And I remember when, hey, you know, Facebook recommends, hey, you and Anisha know the same person, John, and maybe your friends. And you and I look at each other and, oh, we have a couple mutual friends. How do you know John? How do you know this person? I love all those people. These are all great friends. That was like the early days of the growth algorithm. Now it's like, first of all, I don't use Facebook anymore, but when I last did, it's like, hey, you and Anisha have 200 mutual friends. And I can ask you, oh, how do you know this person? Oh, I don't know them. And oh, how do I know this? Oh, I never, they just, they followed me. And I don't know any of these people. I bring this up just because um, in this case, I feel like Facebook has usurped the word friend from the English language. And we have convinced ourselves that we can have hundreds of friends or thousands of friends. And that like to be followed is to be an admirable thing. And we've th that's all coming out of the intent of the system. It's all coming out of like the way the system was designed. But you don't have 500, you know, 5,000 friends, right? There's there's the Dunbar number, which we learned about in the making of this project, where you can only really maintain, humans can only really maintain 150 close relationships that just due to the physical demands of time, like after that number, the, the quality and the ability to connect dwindles more and more. And so what I've been thinking about is like, who's in my Dunbar circle? Who's in my, who do I want to spend time with that, that meet that like 150 criteria if I can only fit 150 people in a deep, meaningful way in my life? And so what would social media look like if it optimized for that? What if it optimized for how much time have you spent with your best friends? How deep have you, you know, brought your conversations? What are you wrestling with in life? What are you struggling with? And how can technology potentially help that or foster that or enable that? Um, and and those are those are totally different types of starting questions. But I think those are the questions that would yield better technology. Maybe a social media platform that only allows 150. Friends. That could be great. That would be fascinating. Like, I yeah, I would I'd try that. That'd be kind of cool. So we have one final question from the audience, and that is from William. For people working in entertainment, where the number of followers is starting to matter more and more, such as film, modeling, dance, how do you leave social media and still have a successful career? Uh, it's a great question and it's a challenging one. And um, uh, I, I feel fortunate in that in the way our film projects work, um, uh, I don't feel like we have a need for a meaningful social media following. That's not my goal or objective, uh, but I do recognize for a bunch of industries that may be. Um, I think there are real questions around, uh, I, I know of a lot of artists who, when they try to get a, um, a job or a contract that the editor or, or somebody is like, well, how big is your follower count? And that is a metric that people are looking for. I, I think that's something that we can push back on and say, you know, we don't want to play that game. That's not what we're looking for. Um, I think it really depends on if your uh, if the content that you're making is digitally distributed or if it's in real life or what the experiences are or, or what kind of content one is making. Um, 
but to move away from follower count and to move towards some of those more subjective measurements um, that the audiences that see your work respond in this way, or these are quotes and testimonials from people that have seen my art, or this is the experience of our community um, that engages with our material. I, I think these are the challenging things that we need to create new ways to move off of uh, a numbers at all costs measurement system um, that would, uh, would really allow um, the creators to do the work that they want to create. Um, I would point back to uh, Patreon as an option around subscribers um, and people who are fans of one's work. Um, and it doesn't need to be subscriber count, but it could be the, the depth and the nuance of people believing in your work and wanting to support more and more. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Jeff, we're coming up at the end of time, and I'd really like to thank you for your time today. This has been an incredible talk. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anisha. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And thank you to the audience for their time as well. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>